Coronavirus moves into the Oval Office. As the president and first lady test positive, Michigan changes its approach to COVID-19. Voter suppression efforts in Michigan lead to felony charges against two right-wing operatives. And the Beaumont merger plan falls apart. Today is Sunday, October 4th, 2020, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint as we arrive at the one month mark. One month until the 2020 election, which was thrown into further turmoil early Friday morning when the president announced that he and the first lady have both tested positive for the coronavirus. Hours later, he was on his way to Walter Reed Medical Center. The concerns are many, of course, starting with the health and well being of the American president. And no doubt, an already bizarre campaign season will again have to detour around another sinkhole. I had no intention at all of talking today about Tuesday night's horrendous debate, though you do now have to wonder if that's it for the Trump-Biden debate schedule. But if nothing else, it is a powerful caution about the virus. All of the precautions and testing we were told were happening around the president and those coming in contact with him, and it still manages to get under the doorway. Now, as that was happening, the Michigan Supreme Court was announcing a decision ruling against Governor Whitmer's emergency powers and pandemic declarations of the last five months. And it throws into question so many executive orders that she's issued, it is still unclear whether or how this will roll back those many orders. The governor says they will remain in place at least for the next three weeks or so. But that came just after we learned that Michigan's controversial pandemic nursing home policy is changing. And we're going to talk about that this morning, about what that change means. And back to the election, we're also going to talk about the charges filed against two infamous political operators that the attorney general says were behind a big effort to keep certain Michiganders from voting. Attorney General Dana Nessel and Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson spoke with me earlier this week about that and the other issues swirling around election security. I should note that that conversation did come before the court's decision regarding the governor because otherwise it certainly would have been good to hear the AG's take on that ruling. We're also going to talk today about the collapse of the proposed merger between Beaumont Health System and Chicago-based Advocate Aurora, a plan that could no longer bear the weight of so much pushback. It's a very busy Busy Sunday today on Flashpoint. Mail in voting sounds great, but did you know that if you vote by mail, your personal information will be part of a public database that will be used by police departments to track down old warrants? Now, of course, that's not true, but two rather notorious political operatives have been charged with being the forces behind that call, working to suppress the vote, not only in Michigan, but several other states as well. Jacob Wohl and Jack Berkman are now facing charges filed by the Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel, who is back with us again on Flashpoint, along with the Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. Good to have you both with me. And uh, uh, Attorney General Nessel, let me start with you on this case. Do we have any idea how many people may have heard these calls? Yeah, we do. In the metropolitan Detroit area and in, in the state of Michigan, about 12,000 people. Um, across five different states, about 85,000 people were contacted. The two men that I mentioned that are charged, uh, oddly enough, actually attach their names uh, to this, uh, this campaign, to this effort. So it wasn't very difficult for you to track them down. I have no idea what their defense on this will be, but I'm assuming other states will be coming after them as well. How, uh, how likely is it that you're going to be able to proceed and prosecute this to the full extent that you'd like to? Well, we feel very comfortable with the charges. We would not have authorized criminal charges if we didn't think there was a compelling case here. Um, we established a robocalling uh, unit in our office just to track down illegal robocalls over a year ago. So it was very easy for us to track where these calls were coming from. Uh, we did send agents to California and worked uh, in cooperation with the California Attorney General's office and executed some search warrants. And um, we feel as though there's substantial evidence to support these charges. And I do expect that there will be charges coming in other states as well. But, you know, the message that we want to send to everyone is that, you know, this is not a joke. It's not a prank. It's voter disenfranchisement. Uh, it's voter suppression. And it's illegal here in the state of Michigan and many other states as well. And we're going to take it very, very seriously. When you mislead a person into uh, deterring them, from voting, that is a crime, it's a felony, uh, and no matter who you are, no matter where you are, we will find you, 
uh, and we will investigate and then prosecute. Uh, these two gentlemen that I mentioned are, are, are no strangers uh, to you or to other people in law enforcement. They've been kind of busy over the years uh, furthering uh, right-wing conspiracy theories as well. Let me bring uh, Secretary of State Benson in to comment on this as well. Uh, Jocelyn, I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to whether you think, which is the bigger problem that you worry about? Is it voter fraud? <laughs> or voter suppression, or are both of them a little overrated as problems as we head toward Election Day? Well, I always look at two things, data, and also you know, what has uh, the greatest impact in relation to that data on citizens' ability to cast their ballots. And we know voter fraud is infinitesimal, but certainly we want to make sure any perception of fraud or concerns about fraud are addressed. And that's why we have so many security protocols in place for our absentee ballots as well as in-person voting to protect the sanctity and integrity of the process. And then when it comes to voter suppression, it's similarly working to make sure voters are protected from any efforts to suppress their vote. And we do know that there have been escalating attempts to misinform voters about their rights. Robocall is a great example of one. And I think the example of our actions together might uh, the attorney general in my office uh, to swiftly react and, and and address and correct this misinformation underscores how important it is for my office to ensure that voters are getting trusted, accurate information about their rights. My pal Vince Keenan, uh, of course, m really made his chops on voter education over the years. I turned to him time and again when I need advice on these things, and he was telling me that voters need to be a little bit tough about this. They need to be tough. In, this is their baby, and they need to handle mm -hmm. that. You can't get knocked off of your mission by either a phone call or somebody at the polls who might have a legal right even to challenge your vote that you need to show up ready to fight for your right to vote. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. I've been saying throughout this cycle, voters need to be vigilant. They need to be fully educated about their options to vote this year and vigilant against any attempts to misinform them or others about those rights and the sanctity of the process. Uh, Dana, would you? I, I would assume you, you'd agree, because we might see people's vote being challenged at polling places. Uh, that, that, that's a right that voters have. That's right, but what they don't have a right to do is to threaten people or intimidate them while they're trying to vote. And we're going to make sure that doesn't happen. We are in contact with law enforcement agencies all over the state, and I'm working very closely, in fact, with Mayor Duggan uh, and with Chief Craig on this for the city of Detroit. So we want to make sure that if people choose to vote in person, that in no way, shape, or form do they feel as though they are being threatened while they are at the polls. Yeah. That's unacceptable, it's illegal, and people will be arrested and prosecuted if that occurs. But we also want to let people know that there's an avenue to turn to. If you feel as though you're on the receiving end of misinformation, you can report that to us at the state at misinformation at Michigan.gov, yeah. and we'll investigate. Terribly important. I want to let you both weigh in on where we're headed now on the vote count. Uh, we saw the decision where the vote has to, your, your mail-in vote has to be uh, turned, has to be postmarked uh, by the day before the election, but then uh, it could be up to 14 days uh, before it necessarily has to be counted. We had a judge this past week uh, uphold the legislature's right to appeal that decision, and I, I'm wondering where you think we're headed on this. Let me start with you, Dana Nessel, because it doesn't sound like you, the state is going to challenge that judge's ruling on that. No, I mean, we thought it was important that there be some sense of finality. I mean, voting has already started. Yes. So voters need to know when their vote will count and how exactly they should go about voting in the first place. So we felt as though it was important just to abide by the, uh, the court's ruling. Now, there are uh, a couple of challenges, the one that you stated. There's a challenge in federal court. And for those reasons, what Secretary of State Benson and I are doing is we are encouraging everyone to get their ballot in the mail. If they're choosing to vote by mail, no, no later than October the 20th to make sure that between delays in the mail and whatever happens on these cases, everyone wants to make sure that their vote counts. And if you get your vote in two weeks early, you can know that that will be the case. And if you can't get it in the mail by October 20th, you can simply take it to your clerk's office or you can take it to a drop uh, box and know that your vote will be there in time. And also there's a way to trace your uh, ballot so that you know it's been received by your local clerk. True. Secretary Benson, though, if, if even with people getting the vote in early, if we've actually got two weeks of lag time at the end of this, never mind uh, knowing on election night who the winner will be, can you actually see a scenario where the election isn't certified for two weeks after Election Day? 
Well, potentially, but that's some of the details that, that Michigan and other states, well, well, I should also say first, the actual certification of the election does come two weeks after the election day. Uh, so, so nothing has changed there. And in fact, I, I suspect that's why the court ruling lines up with the 14 days. Uh, but that said, we want to minimize the number of ballots that, that are sent prior to election day and received after. That's the bottom line. And because we're just not sure the current court ruling says they would count, that may get overturned. And so we want citizens to, you know, if they're going to mail their ballot in, as the attorney general mentioned, do it soon, but no later than two weeks prior to election day. And at any point, you can use your local drop box or return it at your clerk's office and ensure that it's received and counted on time. You beg. And if for I can add a couple things, Devin, if you don't mind, I'm sorry. Just to be mindful of the fact that uh, for a voter, a, a family member, a resident in your household can take you to the polls, take you to the clerk's office, take you to the drop box. Or um, you can give it to uh, somebody to actually drop off as long as they are a member of your household uh, or as long as, uh, you know, they're a relative or you have a legal relationship with them. But also anybody can just drive you. Anybody at all, uh, you can get a ride from and they can take you right to the polls or to the clerk's office or drop box so that you can drop off your ballot. Uh, we, we have so many people who are worried. They've heard about so many ballot applications being sent to one house or even ballots in some cases. Uh, Josh Jocelyn Benson, let me, before, as we, we, we get close to wrap, needing to wrap this up here a little bit, uh, I, I guess explain the system, uh, how this works with the qualified voter file that doesn't allow them all to be counted. Correct. I mean, no matter how many applications you get, no application can actually be return, be submitted, and, and you can't get a ballot in return unless you actually sign that application or a voter signs that application and that signature matches the signature we have on file. So no matter how many applications you or anyone else get or who sends you what, you only can get a ballot with one application and a valid signature. And then only one ballot can be sent per voter and only one ballot will be counted per voter. So that's why it's so important that if you do vote by mail, sign the envelope outside the ballot in which your ballot is returned. If only these were the last questions that I needed to ask you both before we get to Election Day. Thank you both so much for the time. I will talk to you again soon. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Back with more Thanks on for Flash having us. You bet. Back with more on Flashpoint right after this.